Welcome everybody to the Simsbury Free Library, and uh, we're happy to have everyone here. We're happy to have Walt Woodward here, who I keep referring to as Walt Woodman in the kitchen. Good <laughs> <laughs> people, yes. <laughs> people. Anyway, um, we're happy to have him here. He's an associate professor at UConn, where he specializes in, you can correct me if I'm wrong, early American and Atlantic world history, the history of Connecticut, and public history. Um, he in uh, 2004, he became Connecticut's third state historian. But the interesting thing, and I don't know if they'll tell you about this, is before becoming a historian, he was a folk singer, a country music composer, a commercial jingle writer, and the owner of an advertising agency. So, and he was also born in Vienna, where his father was uh, served as a military attaché in the Air Force. You so, did it. You did your homework. You That's oh, amazing. Well, there you go. Wow. Can't run away from those sins, can you? <laughs> Thanks for coming out. I thought everybody would be home tonight on the patio with a cocktail. It's just so nice out there. So to make this sacrifice and be here, it's terrific. Thank you. I want to talk tonight about war, but in a, about war, <clears throat> excuse me, in a, in a way that you may never have heard it talked about before. Because what I want to talk about tonight is Connecticut's earliest Indian War happened just after the colony was founded. One of the most important. And what I want to talk about tonight is not what happened in the war, but what didn't happen in the war. It's called The Cost of Battles Not Fought, Rumors and War in Early New England. <clears throat> Studies of war often seem to focus on a few essential themes. Causation, why did they fight? Conflict, where and how did they fight? And outcomes, who won and what happened because they did? Such questions are essential and each of them, cause, conflict and outcomes, can be analyzed in a multitude of richly productive ways. But in my study of early New England's Anglo-Indian Wars, I find there's one important aspect of war that a focus on cause, conflict, and outcomes usually leads us to overlook. And that's the tremendous toll that a war footing takes on those who never actually, or only rarely, experience any part of the actual fighting. The biblical prophecy, that there shall be wars and rumors of wars has proved true in virtually all times and places. Yet we almost always focus on the wars and not the rumors. I want to think with you tonight about those rumors and how to incorporate their impact into our understanding of conflict, not just in the early Indian wars, but in every war, every conflict we face. My argument here, or my underlying premise, is that the greatest expenditure of resources, human, material, and psychic, in many conflicts, is exerted by people defending themselves from things they fear will happen, but don't. Yet these ancillary costs are almost always forgotten, which makes war seem far less a drain on capacities than it actually is. So that's my premise. But let's begin our look at the cost of battles not fought with the start of one that was. Connecticut Colony's May 1st, 1637 order to launch an offensive war against the Pequot Indians. Tensions between the colonists and the Pequots had been escalating dramatically for over a year. But Connecticut's declaration of war came in direct response to a late April attack by a force of 200 Pequot and Wangunk warriors on the little town of Wethersfield, the smallest of the three Connecticut plantations. Six English men and three women had been killed in the surprise attack, and two young girls were taken captive. Stunned by the assault and seeing it as an existential threat, Connecticut declared war and quickly fielded a force of 90 Englishmen a militia commanded by Captain John Mason, an experienced veteran of the Dutch wars in Europe. Uh, he, was, he was a seasoned and a pretty good fighter. 
Most historians' accounts of the Pequot War focus on the battles that followed. That story is, for the most part, clearly delineated. Within two weeks of the May 1st Declaration, Massachusetts and Connecticut uh, and a Mohegan and Narragansett force, or allies, killed some 400 to 700 Pequot people at the Mystic Fort fight. We almost always connect the Pequot War with the Mystic Massacre. If you remember anything about it, people think Mystic Massacre. Stunned by the carnage, the Pequots abandoned their homeland. They were defeated again in July in a swamp battle near present-day Fairfield. The Pequot sachem Sasicus, Sasicus escaped, but he was executed by the Mohawks and, and Mohegans in New York, or New Netherland at the time. By August 1st, two months after it was declared, two months after the beginning of the war, the Pequot War was effectively over, at least for the historians. Today, though, I want to consider with you the lasting effects the attack on Wethersfield had on that town and others like it far removed from the actual fighting. For them, the Pequot War lasted much longer, was much more uncertain, and far more terrifying than the historian's accounts show. Because coupled with the uncertainty of relationships with their neighboring Dutch neighbors in New York, these towns, even those far removed from the fighting, the ones who never saw any of the actual conflict during the war, lived for more than a generation in fear of attacks that never came and for which they felt terribly ill-prepared. Theirs is a story of unremitting vulnerability caused by hunger, mistrust, history, and most important, the tremendously persuasive power of rumor. We live in a time where rumors fly like arrows again. So I think implicit, even though we're not talking about battles, this discussion of rumors has some real significance for now. Hunger made the attack on Wethersfield an attack on every English town. One of the most significant facts about the Pequot raid is that it took place just as the English planting season was getting underway. The two-year period leading up to the conflict had been a time of dearth and desperation all over New England, but especially so in Connecticut. A third year of poor harvest threatened to undermine the whole New England project. The Pequots understood this, which is why they attacked Wethersfield during the late April planting, and why eight of the nine English people killed were out working in their fields when they died. To underscore further the threat they posed to the English people's food security, the Pequots at Wethersfield also killed 20 cows and a mare. That was an absolute message to the English. English colonists always felt and were most vulnerable to attack when working in the fields. Yet in the spring of 1637, that was where they desperately needed to be. The reality of that gave news of the Wethersfield attack a special psychic force all over New England, one with lasting effects. What we plant, one English farmer reported that year, is before our doors, little anywhere else. That's all over New England. Another reason the Wethersfield attack so quickly generalized to fear of attack in many places is that the English everywhere simply didn't know which Indians, if any, they could trust, and vice versa. The Indians didn't know which English they could trust. Anglo-Indian alliances were confusing, fluid, and tenuous to all parties. They were subject to unilateral revision or termination, and they were based on agreements subject to conflicting interpretations. This made the stability of any Anglo-Indian alliance a source of anxiety. They were always fraught, and the Wethersfield attack made by a Pequot force allied with a local band previously trusted as friends by the English underscored the fragility of those alliances. This tenuous nature of alliances fed a historic specter, too, that gave the report of any Indian attack powerful area-wide significance. That specter, 
that memory lurking in the background of all the English colonists, was the 1622 attack of the poet and confederation on English settlements up and down the James River of Virginia. A coordinated series of surprise attacks that had left one quarter of that colony's population dead in a single morning. That event was seared into the consciousness of New England planners, and nothing was as much feared as a pan-Indian alliance, a union of all the Indian tribes against the English settlements. Any Indian attack was seen as a potential harbinger of coordinated multi-tribal assaults to come. So if you heard about one, you worried about all the others. For all these reasons, news of the Wethersfield attack spread fear like wildfire among the English. Now this is a, a strange, it's actually a copy of the first map ever made in New England. But it's kind of bizarre. I think you can see Cape Cod there, right? And if you'll notice, the focus here, as it, as it was in people's minds at the time, was on the rivers. So if you look at the rivers going up into the land, you'll see there's, uh, there's Narragansett Bay, there's the Thames River, there's the, uh, is that the Connecticut? No, that's the, yeah, that's the Connecticut over on the left-hand side of the page. Anyway, enough about the map. News of the Wethersfield attack spread fear like wildfire among the English. And as it spread, it generated additional, even more fearful rumors. In Boston, word of the raid was augmented by another report, subsequently proved false, that 60 English men had been killed in an Indian attack on Springfield. After another rumor surfaced that the Narragansetts, southern New England's largest Indian tribe, were being courted by the Pequots to join an anti-English confederation. Fear gripped the Bay Colony as firmly as it held Connecticut. Towns all over were put on the highest alert. The Massachusetts Governor Council ordered that none should go to work, uh, nor travel, no, not so much as to church without arms. Take a soldier with you when you go to church. A corps of guards of 14 or 15 soldiers was appointed to watch every night, and sentinels were set in convenient places all around the colony. Plymouth ordered a guard of 12 musketeers to accompany and protect their governor wherever he went. The Bay Colony and Plymouth Colony joined Connecticut's river towns, waiting anxiously for attacks that never came. These fears of attacks were reinforced and amplified by the rumors that flew like projectiles across New England that year and for many years thereafter. The social psychologist Robert H. Knapp, who was in charge of rumor control, this was a real job, for the Massachusetts Committee of Safety during World War II, theorized the influence of rumors in that war in ways that are useful when analyzing their effects in the Pequot War or even the effects of rumors today. War conditions are especially productive of rumors, Knapp argued. <laughs> I can't believe it. It is Robert H. Knapp calling the <laughs> later. <laughs> Sorry about that. The social psychologist Robert H. Knapp, blah, 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 uh, he theorized the influence of rumors in a ways that are useful when analyzing rumors during the Pequot War. War conditions are especially productive of rumors, Knapp argued, because military secrecy makes reliable information both intensely valued and extraordinarily scarce. You want to know what your enemy is doing if they're out in the field. Rumors fill war's information gaps, even as they give voice to the emotional insecurities or the aggressive feelings of the people spreading the rumors. Rumored information, of course, beats no information at all, and most rumors, even though they're spread by word of mouth, they always have some kind of trapping with them, such as attribution to a high-ranking source. You know, White House, a White House official reported today. Have you heard that in the past year or two, right? So a high-ranking source that makes the rumor seem credible. At the same time, 
they also clearly reflect and reinforce the anxiety, aggressive feelings, or wishful thinking of the rumor spreaders. So rumors are very powerful strategic tools used in a lot of ways. Some rumors are primarily informational. They tell you things. Others are primarily expressive. They help people get their feelings out. Most, though short enough to travel by word of mouth, contain both information and an emotionally charged interpretive slant. The person telling you the story wants you to feel a certain way. Knapp posited the usefulness of three types of rumors. Anxiety or fear-inducing rumors, pipe dream or wishful thinking rumors, and wedge driving or aggression rumors that express latent hostility and cause disunity. Now think about that, the three rumors, anxiety or fear-inducing, they scare you. Pipe dream or wishful thinking, ah, it's all gonna be better when. Or wedge driving or aggression rumors that express hostility and cause disunity. Any rumors like that flying around our world these days? Hmm. All three forms of rumor figured prominently in the whirlwind of misinformation that accompanied the Pequot War, and none of the war's victors, Connecticut, Massachusetts, the Narragansett Indians, or the Mohegan Indians, were immune from spreading rumors. Roger Williams, the Massachusetts exile at Providence Plantation, was a frequent reporter of Pequot War rumors. Between May 1637 and the summer of 1638, Williams passed along 35 rumors he gathered from English leaders, native sachems, and a cast of characters in transit. Eight of those rumors were the kind that fed colonists darkest fears and reinforced expectations of attack, such as the rumor that there had been a far greater slaughter than the Wethersfield attack at the English plantations in Connecticut, or the rumor that the Pequots have entered into a league with the man-eating Mohawks. It is this fear of cannibalism was real. When they said man-eating Mohawks, it, it suggested, you know, you think about the fear that could induce. Um, it, it was, people took it seriously. Considering that Williams was only one among literally thousands of conduits for rumors, you can imagine that the climate of fear throughout New England created by these rumors was intense and the resources expended in responding to the fears of possible attack extremely costly in both material expense and diverted agricultural labor. Knapp found that fear-inducing rumors are the most powerful of all rumor types because of the potential danger involved in ignoring you. In the climate of continuous fear rumors that swept New England in 1637 and 38, colonial towns and Indian villages as well had no choice but to remain on constant and extreme alert. Williams was aware of the value of rumors as propaganda. <clears throat> And on at least two occasions, he deployed rumor to serve English goals. In one instance, he deliberately passed along a fear rumor that the Mohawks and Pequots had slain many English and natives at Connecticut. He told people this. He sent it to Massachusetts Governor Winthrop, not because he really believed it, but because he knew Winthrop could then use that rumor to mobilize the citizenry was absolutely intentional and strategic, fictitious rumor. On another occasion, he manufactured a wishful thinking rumor to allay Narragansett Indian fears of a rumored defeat of the English allies. So what did he say? He said the English forces hadn't been wiped out. They'd simply gone back to Hartford for provisions. He didn't know where the English forces were. Now. If the widespread presence of fear rumors helps to explain the prolonged war footing of the colonists during the Pequot War, the even more numerous and persistent wedge driving rumors help explain the chronic states of military mobilization that characterize the post-war years. Wedge driving or aggression rumors, they divide groups by calling into question the loyalties of allies. Their essential motivation, according to Knapp, is aggression against or hatred of the group targeted by the rumor. 
Roger Williams passed along wedge driving rumors more than twice as often as fear rumors. 21 of his rumors uh, contained information reflecting negatively on one or another of the Pequot War allies, compared to eight that were only fear-inducing. This very high and disproportionately number of wedge-driving rumors in Williams' reports shows just how much the allies in the Pequot War really didn't trust each other. Conditions specific to the Pequot War made it particularly fertile ground for the fabrication of wedge-driving rumors. Though the English, uh, in victory, tried to capture and execute all the Pequot warriors, that was their stated and explicit goal, they found it nearly impossible to do so. Blood bonds linked many Pequots to other tribes, uh, regional tribes. There, there were kinship bonds among all of these tribes in Connecticut in the 17th century. So, it wasn't unusual for a fighter who had been a Pequot warrior to seek temporary shelter with family members who were members of another band to avoid English detection. In this fluid environment, it wasn't easy for the English to determine where the enemy was or at times even who was the enemy. Native groups used this English confusion to undermine tribes with whom they were in conflict by suggesting that those tribes, you know, our tribe's enemy, even if they claimed to be English allies, were actually, excuse me, aiding and abetting the Pequots by offering them shelter and concealing their identities. Williams reported 16 wedge-driving rumors asserting that various tribes were secretly giving sanctuary to Pequots. The largest number of these aggression rumors were lodged by the Narragansetts against the Mohegans and their Sachem Uncas. These were two tribes that hated each other. So the Narragansetts said, boy, if we can make the English realize that Uncas is sheltering Pequot warriors, then they'll hate them too. Um, that although, you know, the ironic thing here is that the Narragansetts and the Mohegans had joined together with the English as allies to fight the Pequots. But once the Pequots were brought down, they competed fiercely to assume the Pequots' former regional hegemony. Similarly, uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts had allied against the Pequots. You know, we often think that all the New Englanders were one group of people. They weren't. Massachusetts didn't like Connecticut. Connecticut didn't like Massachusetts. Connecticut people moved out of Massachusetts to get here. But faced with the war, they fought together. Like the Narragansetts and Mohegans, the English, too, competed fiercely for control over the Pequot lands. In this four-way power play, each party recognized, whether you were Mohegan, Narragansett, Connecticut, or Massachusetts, you knew it was good to have an ally from the other group. You wanted, if you were English, you wanted an Indian ally. If you were Indian, you wanted an English ally. Having close relations with a cross-cultural partner was good. So they used wedge-driving rumors to support their efforts to build these alliances. The Narragansetts sought to establish um, yeah, the Narragansetts, come on, there you go. The Narragansetts sought to advance their status with Massachusetts through wedge-driving rumors intended to undermine the perceived loyalty and trustworthiness of the Mohegans and their leader, Uncas. Such rumors claimed that Uncas was offering protection to 300 Pequots and their allies, or that Uncas himself took part in the killing the English soldiers at Saybrook. Several of the aggression rumors cast doubt on Connecticut's actions as well as the Mohegans. Roger Williams reported, among other things, that Connecticut officials were accepting mighty bribes of wampum from Uncas and that Connecticut knowingly allowed him to harbor a Pequot who had killed and tortured an Englishman. While Williams and the Narragansetts were disseminating these negative rumors against Uncas and the Mohegans. I know you need a program to follow this, but I'm going to try to make it clear. The Narragansetts want the, want the Massachusetts to hate Connecticut. 
Connecticut and the Mohegans were spreading the same kind of rumors about the Narragansetts. Reports from Connecticut claimed that the Narragansetts had offered sanctuary to a large number of refugee Pequots and that their sachem himself was plotting to kill Connecticut's most important interpreter, a man named Thomas Stanton. Okay, so that's the Indians spreading rumors about each other. What about the colonies? Massachusetts wasn't immune from spreading wedge driving rumors either. The Bay Colony's rumor mongering was interesting, however, because it seems not to have been targeted at Indian tribes as much as at Connecticut. In a blistering letter, and, and I have to tell you, I have read literally thousands of letters written in the colonies in the 1600s. This one letter written by Reverend Thomas Hooker to Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop in 1638 is the angriest letter I have ever read. It is eight pages of sitting there saying, your people have done this, your people have done this. What are you, are you trying to kill us? It's, he is, this minister is furious at Massachusetts and he is just, he's, he is, He's firing on all cylinders. So an outraged Reverend Thomas Hooker accused Massachusetts of having waged an aggressive, concerted, coordinated rumor campaign to discourage new settlers from going to Connecticut. Massachusetts uh, had told potential Connecticut settlers, among other things, to go any whither, be anywhere, choose any place, any patent, Narragansett, Plymouth, only go not to Connecticut. You see why he's mad. Their upland will bear no corn. Their meadows are nothing but weeds. And the people, the people are almost starved. A rumor, a rumor that Massachusetts spread that cut so deep because it had so much truth in it. Hooker's letter underscores the intensity of the distrust and competition between these two English colonies, something that time has just made us forget. But that competition was a consequence of the lands that opened up in the aftermath of the Pequot War. The net effect of the Indian and English rumor campaigns and the mistrust they simultaneously reflected and created was this. Though the outcome of the Pequot War was decisively determined in the summer of 1637, the war was militarily over in two months. There would be no real peace in New England for the next 35 years. No one, Narragansett, Mohegan, Connecticut, or Massachusetts, fully trusted any of the other parties, nor did the tribes and colonies with whom these four intermingled. Relations among them all would be fluid and strained, frequently punctuated by rumor-prompted crises that triggered widespread alerts and or led one or more parties to put fighters in the field. These chronic states of hypervigilance of towns and villages on alert and ad hoc military mobilization were a tremendously costly drain on psychic energy, labor, and economic activity for both natives and English. 1637 to 1675, almost 40 years, was a time of wars and rumors of wars, and both were important. Our future histories of this period would be better served, I think, and maybe our understanding of the present would be better served if we incorporate into our thinking the costs of rumors and battles not fought, as well as the ones that are. One of the ironies of the Pequot War and this 40-year period of unrest is that when, after 40 years of expecting a united Indian war, one actually happened in 1675, Connecticut, Connecticut, was the best prepared for the war because the Mohegans and the remaining Pequots from the war sided as allies of Connecticut. They patrolled the Connecticut frontier and were the first to hear if Indians were coming. They provided good information. In the, in the King Philip's War in 1675, you probably all know this, only one Connecticut town 
was destroyed. Yours, yeah, Simsbury. Simsbury, and it, that is an amazing story because if you, I could show you a map of New England. This was a united Indian effort to try to drive the English into the sea, to exterminate them, and it almost succeeded. But in Connecticut, Connecticut lost a lot of men because Connecticut rushed to the fighting wherever it happened intently to keep it out of Connecticut. So the, the cost in lives was terrible, but the cost to, uh, to goods and to towns was nothing like Massachusetts. So Simsbury paid the only price. It didn't pay the only price. It was the only town that was burned. Other towns were abandoned. Woodbury was abandoned. Uh, so Connecticut, Connecticut was on this war alert, but, um, but today, you know, it's a distant memory. The whole war, most people know nothing about the war. It's not surprising. It's not an immediate conflict. But there are great lessons in that one. You know, we're in a time of great conflict now. It, uh, it's not military. It's, uh, you know, we are, we are a conflicted society. And much of our conflict is fed now as then by rumors. And if you just take a time when you hear a rumor, whether you like the rumor or don't like the rumor, just consider the different kinds of rumors and how they could be being deployed to make you feel, think, or act a certain way. Come on in. Um, and that's really, that's it. Thank you so much for coming out. I'll take any questions if you have them. If I don't know anything, I'll create a rumor about somebody. How's that? <laughs> Any questions? Question. Yes. How long um, were the Pequots in Connecticut? I understand they came from New York. Well, the, you know, there has been, 50 years ago it was understood that the Pequots, or actually, yeah, the Pequots came down from New York, a Mohican, a Mohican offshoot. Now they're not so sure because at the, across the river from the Mohegan Casino at Preston, where they, keep, they were going to build a movie studio a few years ago, and now the Mohegans are going to do lots of development along the river. A lot of people don't know this, but there is one of the, it's, it hasn't been excavated yet, but in research surveys, they have found some of the most significant Indian artifacts, a habitation, a huge, native habitation that goes back for thousands of years. So, you know, and, and it's still in the ground, and as long as it's in the ground, it's safe. Um, but its existence has really got people thinking, well, maybe this New York story isn't true. Maybe the native story that they've been here for thousands of years. You know, what we do know is that nobody was here when there was a mile sh thick sheet of ice covering Connecticut about 13,000 years ago. But uh, after that, there probably weren't native people. Yes? It's a little bit off topic, but you talked about the trans one of the most important translators was targeted. And I'm just thinking, how does somebody become a translator when you don't send them to school? Often, it is by trade. The, the, the Dutch had been trading with the Indians along the Connecticut River since 1614 at least that early, maybe years before. Indians and Dutch traders and Indians and English traders, they'd had communications. It, Indians wanted the things the English traders had. They, had. they had heavy wool blankets. They had copper pots. Not only were the copper pots a lot more sturdy than the pottery you made, but it was portable. And you could cut out the copper and make these really nifty arrowheads with it. They got very good at doing that. So a lot of trade back and forth, and it's part of trade, you know, knife, squatch it, knife, squatch it. So now I'm the English person. I know a knife is a squatch it. You know it's a knife. And if you do that a lot and you have that facility with language that you obviously have because you teach languages, you can pick it up. It may be a pigeon, but it's, you know, it's very good communication. So that's how they did it. No, no UN level interpretation. No, no, although, you know, in, in Massachusetts by 16, early 1640, John Eliot, 
who Reverend John Elliott, who they, they called in his lifetime the apostle to the Indians, was working on translating the Bible into Massachusetts so that the Indians could, could become converted to Christianity. And in my little town of Columbia in the 1700s, a reverend named Eliezer Wheelock started an Indian school to both convert Indians to Christianity and to teach them how to become missionaries to other Indian tribes. So he, he had that school for 30 years. He had men learning how to be missionaries. They brought in girls learning how to be wives to missionaries. And um, one, of the, one of those Indians, a man named Samson Ockham, went to England, raised the equivalent of $12 million to found a bigger college for the Indians. Wheelock, when Ockham came back, Wheelock said, this is great. He took the money and he founded Dartmouth. <laughs> Ockham didn't like Wheelock anymore. And, you know, it's a long, and Dartmouth to this day is working to kind of, you know, do paybacks for that. They, they have a very active Indian education program. Yes? Uh, uh, captives, I mean, being with the translation, did they capture people, um, did the Indians capture English people and vice versa, they, and then they would learn to speak? In the initial attack on Wethersfield, there were two girls who were taken captive by the Indians. They were sailed down the Connecticut River in canoes. Uh, they were wearing shifts or night dresses, but the Indians took, uh, we don't know, we don't think they were naked, but we think they were wearing the equivalent of nightgowns. They took their regular clothes, they put them up on oars, they kind of hung them, raised them from their, their canoe as sails, and they had the girls stand up and they sailed past the English fort at Saybrook, taunting the English. So these were the only captives that we know of in the Pequot War, the only uh, English captives in that war. But in the wars that followed, there were a lot of captives taken. And the whole story of what happens to, what happens to an English girl, 12 or 13, when she's taken captive by an Indian tribe and taken to Canada and either adopted into an Indian tribe or uh, adopted into a French Catholic family and she becomes a Catholic. Can you believe it? A Catholic? A New England Puritan girl become a bloody papist? <laughs> it, many wonderful stories. They call them captivity narratives. Many women who came back wrote these wonderful, they're very moving stories of their treatment. Uh, often it was pretty good. Sometimes it was great. Sometimes not so good at all. So, yes? I heard a rumor that Simsbury yeah. was burned out of, um, because of the incident of this Indian Manahanus who burned down some kitchen tar works that uh, Michael Humphrey and John Griffin had, and they captured Manahanus, I think, and held him and were going to uh, sell him in, in slavery, except he was ransomed by giving the English all of his territory, which was Masako. Have you ever heard that rumor? I, I love the story. I don't, it may be, it may be true, it may not be, it's not a rumor I've heard. Here's what I know. I know that by the 1700s, there was a lot of pitch and tar making going on up and down the Connecticut River from here north to what's now the Massachusetts border. So this, and, and that provoked a lot of conflict between towns and between people and with natives. So the idea that there would be a conflict over pitch and tar with Indians makes a lot of sense, not for 1637, but for you know, 80 or 90 years later. But in the world of legends, you take one thing here, you take one thing there, and you throw in a little oregano, and you bake it for 45 minutes, and wah, delicious, hot, wedge-driving rumor. So. The rumor that we've always heard, those of us who lived in Sydney for a long time, is that King Philip had 
uh, cave on the side of the mountain up here, and that's where he hid out after. It's a seat. He was sitting. He was sitting in what King Philip's seat up on the mountain, and you know, if you go climb up to the high blind tower, somebody along the way will say, oh, "Let's go to King Philip's seat." <laughs> um, I have a feeling that somebody in high school invented that a long time ago. I, I don't know why. That's just my theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for someone attacking a town up north to go south to watch it burn, because if it's an English town, help is going to come from the south, right? I mean, it might have happened, but I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But. Pardon me? There you go. There you go. So it was his brother. <laughs> it's local. He had a doppelganger. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm guessing that the uh, this state of being on edge didn't really end at King Philip's War uh, because we have the whole series of wars with the French uh, and the Indians up until the French and Indian War. Yeah. So do, does this rumor issue continue after that? Then? The anytime there's a war, there is a there, there's. There's a tremendous just battery of rumors that accompany any kind of conflict. The nature, after King Philip's War, a couple of things happened. Most, most of the Indians were either, either of their own choice or were pushed to move west or north. A lot of them went north into what is now New Hampshire, uh, the Northeast Kingdom. The, a lot of them went west into New York. They essentially, a lot of them wanted to get out of this area because they were not welcome. They would never be welcome. There was the memories of King Philip's War. It, it was the bloodiest war per capita in American history. Every family, Indian or English, paid a terrible price in that war. And they came out of it with something akin to hatred. You know. The, there, there was an old cowboy movie expression, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Well, if there ever was a time it was true, in the English mind, it was after King Philip's War. So the Indians who stayed were deeply tied to their homeland. A lot of them said, I don't care, I'm getting out of here. Um, and then the wars that happened right after that and the, the imperial wars were French and it was French and England fighting their wars in America had the same quality of rumors and absolutely all of the same rules applied, who's siding with whom, who's a turncoat, where are they coming, there are people in the field and the alerts were just as bad. But the sense that, I can't even say that because there was the same thing where local Indian tribes would suddenly turn out to be in alliance with the French. They, you know, Schenectady, New York was burned to the ground in 1689. It was a Dutch town, Dutch-English town, but the Dutch traders were so confident in their, in their local tribes that when people came to them and said, you're about to be attacked, they said, not by these tribes. We know these people. They're our friends. Not going to happen. And in the middle of the night, they were attacked, and the place was leveled. So yeah, you're right. It does continue. Yes? Uh, how do these rumors affect settlement patterns? Do people just confine themselves to the towns instead oh, of yeah. setting up independent homesteads? You know, absolutely. The, the, I mean, the immediate effect in King Philip's War is towns that were settled on the frontier drew back in. People, towns were abandoned because they couldn't be protected. Connecticut had had a policy since King Philip's War. You know, we think of the, the American Revolution being the place where the Minutemen were ready to go, but it's in the colonial records that every town had to have at least two dragoons. That's a, that's a soldier with a horse, ready to ride at a minute's notice to go answer an attack in some other town. Because Connecticut was frequently the nearest source of help when a Springfield got attacked, when a Deerfield got attacked, when a Northampton got attacked. So people would, you know, get the word and as fast as they could get there, they'd head up the river. Um, 
I, I, I guess I'm missing the, the train of thought. The, so one of the effects was they made being on alert structural. They, they pulled in the frontier to places where they could protect it. And they had watches and wards. They literally had patrols 24 hours a day and from dusk till dawn. And people who should have been working in the fields were out at night, you know, up all night, being afraid somebody was going to knife them in the back. And when the Indian attacks happen later in the French and Indian War, and we get personal accounts of what's going on in the time leading up to the account, you have people saying, everyone who went out of their cabin was always looking over their shoulder because they didn't know what was behind the next bush. Yeah, they lived in that. They, they lived in this state of high anxiety and danger for generations. Yeah? One of the earliest maps of Sinister, I think it's the earliest map, I think it's from around 1712, mentions the Great Fort. And to the best of our knowledge, it's, I think it's in present day Granby, fort building. Yeah. Um, was that sort of a common um, result of? It's great. That is a great question, and I, I should have talked about this. Yes, one of the things, they did two, two sorts of things. They would build, they'd put palisades around a whole town. So Deerfield, Massachusetts in 1704, was not unlike a lot of towns. It had about 12 inches, you know, at the end of every pole, 12 inches later, there'd be another pole stuck in the ground all the way around the town. These palisades are, are really big structures. Then they take strategic houses. They position them, say, in all, it, they divide the town into four quarters. This is hypothetical, but it worked like this. They take a house in the center here, house in the center there, house in the center here, house in the center there. They declare them garrison houses. And they would work to reinforce you know, double walls, put bricks in between the walls so you can't burn the house down, put holes in it so you can shoot out of these places. And if you hear an alarm, everybody in this section of town, you go to that garrison house. So the combination of palisades and garrison houses were a standard feature of English life till the American Revolution. But Indians would build forts too. So when they say a great fort could be an Indian fort, they were building forts before the English came to protect themselves from the attack by other Indian tribes. And they certainly built them to protect themselves from attacks by English. So, but that, I, I would love to see that map. Do you know if anybody's ever tried to find the place? Yes. Yes, they have. I'm not sure they, no, no luck so far, though, I think. The, does anybody know when that fort dates to? The reason I'm asking is uh, at the Pequot Research Center, there's a battlefield project that's been going on for many years where they are trying to reconstruct all of the battle sites of the Pequot War. And if that was connected with that war, they'd be really interested in, you know, they'd go up with metal detectors, see if they could find pieces of metal or bullets or something to identify it. Yes. Is it possible to visit the, uh, the Pequot uh, Fort Massacre? Is that site available? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. I went out when this battlefield reconstruction project were down there doing the digs. It, it's just such a, it's such a sobering reflection on history. The people who left accounts of the Pequot War, the, the team, the archaeologists who are reconstructing it now, just used those accounts and took them exactly at their word and said, if, if we're reading this right, we're going to find stuff right here. And they found the fort site. It's not where they thought it was. But they found, you know, this is where the English said they were fighting, lots of bullets here. This is where the Indians said they had to shoot their arrows out, lots of arrows here. And it's in a residential backyard in Broughton. It's, you know, it's a bunch of people's backyards. And the homeowners were really nice because they had these archaeologists with metal detectors sticking flags in the ground every three seconds because they found a bullet. They found something they were going to dig up. It's almost eerie how memories 
what I think are really important memories we can learn from get lost like that over time. Yeah. So it's not possible. If you, I could tell you where it is, and you could go walk around. You might get some buckshot or something, but <laughs> but you could see it. Um, it's, not a, uh, it's not a park. It's not a park. There are no most of the most of the Pequot War sites are. They're in either swamps, that's where the Indians fled to try to hide from the English, or they're in residential areas now. So, unfortunately. Is anything known about the two girls that were captured from Wethersfield? Did they survive? They did survive. They actually, the Dutch, the Pequots took them to the Dutch. The Dutch got the Pequots to sell them to the Dutch. The Dutch brought them back to the English, and the English bought them from the Dutch. So they ransomed them. But they did get home. And um, the, the girls said they were well treated. And you know, it, one, of the, one of the really interesting things is that the incidence of any kind of sexual assault on captives, very rare in all of the 17th and 18th century. They would adopt women into tribes. They'd marry them, but that, you know, that they did a lot of, that torture, they'd torture people, but they wouldn't rape them. So I don't know what that means. It's just odd. Yes? Roger Williams, in your talk, seems to have kind of an interesting position there of, uh, you know, if you were to put it in contemporary terms, he's one of the talk, or the, Talking heads on TV at night. Talking ah, that's a great TV. analogy. What, 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 what were his motives for doing well, that? There are some, there are some absolute fault lines that exist in the 17th century. Even when people hate each other, fight each other, there are some things that will unite them together. Being Christian versus being pagan. Whenever pagans fought a war, Christians would fight, you know, they would get, they'd stand together and fight the pagans. As soon as the pagans were dead, they'd turn around and fight each other again. The, Roger Williams was thrown out of Massachusetts because he was stricter than the Puritans, and they didn't like it. They said, you're too harsh. So he went to Massachusetts Bay, but he still kept in touch with them, and when there was an Indian-English war, and it threatened to be against all the English, this pan-Indian alliance, when that's what's on the table. Doesn't matter if I hate you, we're English. We're, and it doesn't matter even that we're English, we're Europeans, so the Dutch will help us get our captives back because we're all, we're all Christians, we're all Europeans, and the Indians may want to kill all of us. So for right now, we're allies, right? War makes strange bedfellows, I guess. I just yes. want to tell everybody that he's been such an engaging speaker that you should check out the podcast, Breaking the Nutmeg, and, and your future has oh. some of those. Oh, let me tell you about a couple of things. I, if, and this one, I, I just love this one, and it has taken so much of my time these days. When was it? Uh, six months ago. I woke up in the middle of the night with this idea. And I went to Connecticut Humanities because they're one of the only groups that has money that can support crazy ideas. And I went to uh, WMPR, to the Connecticut Public Radio people. And I said, we need a radio program today in Connecticut history so that every day there is some really neat fact about Connecticut history and people hear about it and they get excited and they're stimulated to learn our history. Everybody got enthused, they said, let's do it. Who can come up with all these things? Well, where is the state historian? So I've been spending the last, you know, since May 1st, my life is finding there are a whole lot of days where you got to dig to find the interesting <laughs> thing. But there's an amazing amount of stuff that happens. So here's what we did. If you listen to NPR, you'll hear these fast spots are really fast. But we created a website, todayinconnecticuthistory.com, that has this story every day. It's, it's a beautiful website. 
The stories are short, but you can hear about it. The audio is there. There are links to other things and great images. And if you go to the website and go down to the bottom and put in your email address, we'll send you an email every morning and tell you what happened. And if you want to click through to the link, you can. If not, you know anyway. And I'm telling you, over a cup of coffee, you can really impress somebody by saying, yeah. <laughs> did you know that Oliver Ellsworth came up with the great compromise today? Who's Oliver Ellsworth? Why, why do you do this to me before I've had my coffee? <laughs> so today, Today in cthistory.com. And in fact, we'll put it on our website. We'll link it to our website. Thank you. And I'll, you know what? I think I have a pen. And if you would like to sign up, please come up and sign up. And I, we'll get you subscribed. The emails will come to you. You can click through. It's easy to unsubscribe. But you're going to love it. It's really, I am, I am so happy with the way this has worked out. It's a neat site. That and a thing called grading the nutmeg that is lots of, well, we are the nutmeg state, right? And we're grating, G-R-A-T-I-N-G. That's supposed the, to be a pejorative. The nut, that we're the I know, right. that's, why, that's why we did it, because we're grading it away, one podcast at a time. Anyway, we've done 50 podcasts on different things about Connecticut history, museums, places, books. Um, tens of thousands of downloads. There's some uh, really neat things to see, places to go. So today in cthistory.com or grading the nutmeg, I'm done. You can go home. Uh, and thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.